What is it like to be a Jewish believer in Israel? Is there constant harassment? Is there freedom to evangelize? And how open are the Jews of Israel to the Gospel? For a fascinating interview with a Messianic Jewish leader from Israel, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have a very special guest with us from Israel. His name is Dr. Baruch Corman. He is a very anointed Bible teacher, and he is the host of a TV program called Love Israel. Dr. Corman, welcome to thank Christ you, in Prophecy. Thank you, Dr. Reagan. It's a pleasure. So good to have you on, sir. Nathan, thank you. Let's begin. Let's get a little background, if we could. Your TV show, your family, and your study institute in Israel. Well, I've uh, been married 30 years. Okay. I have three adult children. They all served in the Israeli uh, Armed Forces. My oldest daughter in the Air Force and my two other children in the Israeli Army. Wow. And we, we moved to Israel a little over 15 years ago. So you were an American who then made Aliyah? That's right. Okay. That's right. Chicago boy, right? Uh, grew up in Chicago, and after getting, getting, getting married, we moved to Miami Beach. So uh, much better than Chicago. I'd imagine. And in 2002, January, we, okay. we made Aliyah to, to Israel. Let Praise me ask you about that. Did you have any difficulty making Aliyah since you were believers? Well, um, we were very active in the Jewish community, and we, we did everything that they asked us, answered all their questions honestly, mm -hmm. uh, never uh, uh, hid our faith, never was asked about our faith. Okay. And uh, it's very different today. In regard to that, but okay. no, we have had no problems. the The Israeli government, the Israeli people, have have welcomed and, us. Very. And when you make Aliyah, you're you're living uh, really uh, as a ward of the government for almost a year, aren't you? Well, uh, we did not receive. We rejected any type of financial assistance okay. from oh, the okay. government. We didn't need it, thank God. And I, I would say that uh, it's different. Americans, by and large, if you go back many years ago. They received different financial benefits than people from other countries okay. did. So at that time, there was some benefits, like language school mm -hmm. was free. Um, sometimes mortgages you could get at a lower interest rate or less of a down payment, and the government would qualify you. Now, uh, people come from all over the world speaking many different languages. So one of the requirements is they have to get into Ulpan school uh, as soon as possible, and that's what. 10, 12 hours a day, total immersion for a year? Wow. Uh, that's what my wife did. Uh, my Hebrew was a little bit better than okay. that. Okay. And so uh, I began studying in uh, a yeshiva, uh, learning uh, uh, rabbinical, as I did when I was in the States, rabbinical literature. And so uh, I picked up Hebrew as far as understanding it and being very able to communicate. Well, I know sometimes quick. Americans who have studied Hebrew uh, have studied it with vowel pointing and all. They go to Israel, and there's no vowel points they can find. <laughs> they don't know what to do. <laughs> That's right. But once yeah. you know the vocabulary, the vowel points become uh, very. Now tell us about your institute. What, yeah. what is it yeah. all about? Well, it's an institute for uh, scripture. Our, our purpose over there is to introduce people to the Word of God. We believe the greatest. Change that can come upon a person is when they encounter the truth, uh, the truth of God. Amen. And there's Amen. only one place to receive that truth, and that is in the the Scriptures. We teach both the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the uh, Habrit HaChadasha, the New Testament. Right now, we're going through the Book of Luke. Okay. And everything we do primarily is going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And, and we're what all is the name of the institute? Uh, Zeravraham, which is seed of Abraham. Seed of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And is this in Jerusalem? No, it's uh, south of Tel Aviv. Okay. okay. Um, and it's in a, a larger city. And very few Americans are there, what I, what I like. <laughs> and so you talked just, about going verse by verse. Uh, this is one of the things I love about your teaching. You're a, uh -huh. strictly an expository teacher. You just read the verse, comment, and come, move on. Now, this is what you do on your television program. Tell us about your TV program, the name of it, how it got started and so forth. Well, it began with the Hebrew version of the program, which uh, began four, four years ago. It's called Padut Le'amo, which is uh, taken from the Psalms, and it means redemption for His people. 
left, right now. And after doing about a year and a half of that, uh, some people asked, could we do an English version of it? Oh, okay. And so we, we began that uh, three years ago, and uh, it's the same format. In the Hebrew version, we use as a basis the weekly Torah portion, mm -hmm. Parshat HaShavua. Um, in the English version, we go through different books of the Bible. What now, network can they find this on? Uh, the, in Israel, it's on uh, uh, Middle East television, which okay. we're the only show from a believing perspective huh. in the Hebrew language. Well, how did you get on uh, uh, television in Israel in the first place in that first year? Yeah. Um, an individual that's related to uh, Middle East television uh, approached us. We heard that there was an interest in uh, uh, biblical teaching, and so we approached them, and they wanted an English show. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, what if we did it in Hebrew? And they graciously agreed. We had to get permission from the Misrat Hashidur, the broadcast authority in Israel. And they agreed, and we've been on four so years. So, what was it broadcast on? It's broadcast on uh, cable, which okay. Israel only has one cable, and you're on there as yes. well, on mm -hmm. HOT. Yes. And they have a, an Israeli satellite, which is called YES. So, okay. those two networks basically cover all of Israel, about 95%. I've been percent. frankly surprised that the Orthodox would allow uh, this kind of program on television in Israel. We have not had any problems, and right? in fact, uh, it's very, very encouraging that uh, occasionally I'm recognized. Someone has found the show from a religious background, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, they find it interesting. Well, now, I want to ask you about what is it like to be a Jewish believer in Israel? Are you constantly harassed? Uh, not at all. I, I do know that uh, uh, some ministries over there have had problems. A lot of them. We have our study center. It's in a large high-rise on the... Uh, third floor, when someone comes in, there's a security guard. So they have to say you know, why they're going. We don't mm -hmm. have any signage up. Uh, we don't broadcast it. Most of the people that come, they come by invitation, someone that we know. Okay. So we have not had any harassment or problems. I've got a picture here of Avi Mizraki. Avi Mizraki is in Tel Aviv. He's a very uh, aggressive evangelist there. And uh, they come down from Jerusalem, the Orthodox do, and put up wanted signs all over the area uh, for him. He also uh, uh, has experiences that I think are very uh, humorous, where he goes down to the part of Tel Aviv where they have the big fountain, mm -hmm. and uh, he starts handing out brochures. Now, he actually has this on video where he tries to, and people won't accept them until an Orthodox Jew comes and starts harassing. Then everybody wants the brochure because they don't <laughs> like the Orthodox Jews because the Orthodox Jews are trying to enforce their lifestyle on the average Israeli. Um, there's great tension between the Haredi community. In fact, as I was driving to your studios in Israel right now, they are working to have the Giyus. Giyus is the Hebrew word for uh, when you go into the army. What is that called? Uh, giyus. Like uh, being drafted? Being or Being drafted listed? into the army, enlisted yeah. in the army. And uh, the religious community has had an exemption. And right now, all over Israel, there are Hafkanot, uh, demonstrations, Hmm. Highway 1 is closed down. Hmm. Highway 4 is closed down. Many other intersections. Okay. So, because of that, I mean, I think it's very important for people to serve in the military. Oh, yeah. I know of no biblical, and when we talk about Jewish law, halakha, yeah. there is no Jewish law reason that, that a, a person cannot serve. Yes. And the Israeli army does everything, everything, so that people, whether they're Druze, whether they're Arabs, whether they're secular or whether messianic they're the even. most messianic, whatever, can serve in the army. So I take a very strong stance. Now, we love the uh, Haredim, the, the ultra-Orthodox. We, we want to share the truth with them. Uh, I believe they're in darkness, so I don't expect much from them. But I, I am very grieved over the fact that, and I don't expect much from the secular population not to like the uh, Haredim, but I am grieved over the fact that many in the Messianic communities who we're in light, mm -hmm. we should understand their point of view, not necessarily agree with it, but love them and be an mm -hmm. instrument of influence to bring them to the truth. And this, this animosity that I see between the Messianic community and the Haredim, uh, it grieves me. Yeah. Well, speaking of the Haredim, you always see them praying at the Western Wall. And I think many Christians, they look at that and they say, well, Israel is a Christian nation or at least a believing nation in God. Do you believe that Israel is a, a religious nation or do you believe it's more of a secular nation? Uh, um, well, 60% um, of the Israeli population, Jewish population, 
would fall under the category of orthodox. Whether 60%. That's, okay. Whether that's wow. Dati Lumi, which is a national religious, modern orthodoxy, or Haredim, which is 20%. So you have the national religion uh, uh, followers, 40%, Haredim, 20%. You have 40% secular. So it's a very divided, very divided group. So okay. is it secular, is it religious? Yes. And you have Islam and you have yeah, Baha'i. The problem and with the Orthodox is that they're very much like uh, American cultural Christians. They may claim to be Orthodox Jews, doesn't mean they're practicing Orthodox Jews. Um, I, I, I would, you're, you're right. Among the, the Dati Lumi, uh, many of them may not be in the synagogue every day, mm. three times a day. Mm. Uh, but uh, there, there is, within the Orthodox world in Israel, there is a strong commitment, a strong commitment that you don't see. I mean, uh, Judaism, three times a day, every day, there are prayer times. Okay. And, and a high percentage of that 60% are there at that time. Israel, to me, though, comes across as a very, very secular nation, and Tel Aviv in particular. I mean, uh, that's one of the world's center of homosexuality. It, it is. Uh, and Tel Aviv is is highly secular, but when you go a little bit north northeast, you come to Bnei Barak, <laughs> which is one of the largest concentration of Haredim in the world. So lots of times when people are in Israel, because they don't go into the religious communities, they don't see the dense population and the numbers that uh, are are quite quite large. Do you have the freedom to proclaim the uh, share the gospel in Israel? Uh, we, we have that television show, we use the internet, uh, we have no problem with our, our study center. Now there's a law, it's a very good law. Uh, adults, anyone who's over 18 cannot evangelize someone under 18. I think that's good. Huh. I wouldn't want, yeah, yeah. you know, when my children were under 18, they're not now. I wouldn't want someone talking to them without my, my permission. So I think that's a very good law. But if someone's over 18 and the person they're talking to is over 18, you have total freedom to share. So now, that doesn't thing, mean there's another law. Another law that states that you cannot offer an incentive. Uh, that's true. Um, you because they're concerned with ministries giving rental help or doing something, and you're absolutely Almost right. Almost like a buying their faith. Right. Okay. So, so, but it's very easy. Um, th there, there's forums. A lot of ministries have. I have a good friend. Uh, uh, Moran Rosenblatt that runs an excellent humanitarian organization and they abide by that. If they give help, they have a form to make sure the person knows that this gift, this help comes from love with absolutely no yes. strings attached. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a break here and when we come back I want you to share with us something that I find absolutely fascinating and that is what Orthodox Jews believe about the end times. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy, an interview with Dr. Baruch Corman, a Messianic teacher and television host from Israel. Dr. Corman, I, I want to uh, pick up with a very fascinating question to me anyway, and that is, what are the differences between what Orthodox Jews believe about the end times and what many Christians teach about the end times? I, I think the thing that would probably surprise most Christians is that uh, Orthodox Judaism does not believe that all prophecy is going to be fulfilled. All. Oh, they have right? a scenario. If this is the scenario that happens, then it's these prophecies. If it's this scenario over here, then these prophecies are, oh, are relevant. That's interesting. Huh. And, and many of the scenarios depend upon the spiritual condition of Israel. For example, we know that Messiah, when he came the first time, he came riding on a chamor, a donkey. When he comes again, he's coming in the clouds of heaven. Correct? We know that. Now, they will say, and this is found also in the Gemara, part of the Talmud, that if Israel needs to repent, then Mashiach, he'll come riding on a donkey. If Israel, Zakai, if we, we merit it, then he won't come riding on a donkey. He'll come in the clouds of heaven. And today, uh, the, the greatest authorities in Judaism believe that Israel is, is meriting Messiah's return, that all of the, the prophecy having to do with judgment uh, upon this world and hard times, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, all of that has been canceled out. Canceled. Canceled out. And they believe that any <clears throat> moment Mashiach will come 
and the whole creation will be transformed. Is that why so, you hear sometimes that, that the Jewish people believe in two messiahs? Well, uh, there is a concept of two messiahs. Today, the vast majority of authoritative rabbis believe that first one, the Mashiach ben Yosef, okay. that he's the one with, that would come riding on the donkey, that that, that need has been done away with. They're good enough. They, so they're they not merited. Expecting, that's right. They're not expecting wow. Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay. Uh, uh, some deny that altogether, and but all of them are believing that Mashiach ben David will come and set up a kingdom, a utopia, and and there's not going to be that that time of, of hardships in the end. I know over the awesome. years there have been many different orthodox interpretations of Isaiah 53. What is would, would you say is the uh, orthodox interpretation today? Um, one of the problems is honesty. Now, as <laughs> as a believer, you're bound to this book, correct? Yes, right. Okay. You know, people don't want to know our opinions. They want to know the truth of the yes, scripture, right. right? And in that same way, an Orthodox rabbi is bound to the Talmud as well as the Hebrew Bible, but the Talmud is seen as scripture, not a commentary on the scripture, but it has the same authority of a scripture. So, in the Masechet, in the section of the Talmud called Sanhedrin, in, in page 98, Isaiah 53 is mentioned. And hmm. there it says without any doubt that that passage deals with the Messiah. So, oh, okay. that means every Orthodox rabbi, they does not have the freedom to say what they think, what they want. They have to repeat what the text says. So, Orthodox Judaism must affirm that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. Now, that doesn't mean who the Messiah is. It doesn't say it's, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, it just says yeah. it's about Messiah. Rashi, in his commentary on that section, says clearly Isaiah 53 is about Messiah. However, in Rashi's commentary on Isaiah, which many people believe have been edited, there he states, oh no, it has nothing to do with Messiah. It's, it's all about Israel, the Jewish people yes, suffering right. yeah. in the past. Okay. So today, in order to, to take away any possibility that a Jewish person might think Isaiah 53 is about Messiah, there's agreement. It's about Israel. Oh. But that is disingenuous. So Israel is the suffering one. Yeah. Israel is the suffering one. Now you but mentioned, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, but if you go into a, a, a yeshiva, a kolel for, for married men when they study, when you come to this passage, everyone knows it's about Mashiach. No one says it's about Israel. Israel. Now, you Israel. mentioned something that, that's very interesting. There's a parallel between Orthodox Judaism and Catholicism. In Catholicism, they take the position that the interpretations of the Pope and the interpretations of church council have the authority of Scripture. They're, they're equal with Scripture. You're saying in Orthodox Judaism that the commentaries of the sages are equal to Scripture. The, the statements of the sages, yes. uh, that's oftentimes commentary to yes. the Scripture, yes. So there's hmm. continuing revelation by God. No longer, but up until this this time of the, the Gemara, which many people don't know that the Talmud, the Mishnah, was edited in the third century yes. A.D. after the New Covenant, okay. and the Gemara is a hundred to two hundred years later than that. Huh. So the New Covenant is an earlier Jewish book <laughs> than the Talmud. Well, now let me ask: you, if you're talking to an Orthodox Jew and you're trying to, um, you know, bring him to Yeshua. How does he handle Daniel 9 where it's very clearly mm -hmm. prophesied that the Messiah is going to come before the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, it says at the end of the book of Daniel, Daniel, seal up this book for, yes. its, for a later time. So, by and large what happens is that the book of Daniel is not going to be discussed. Oh. And, <laughs> at all. Okay. Well, that's, well, that's convenient. convenient. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, the Israel has replaced the Messiah, and then you have Christians who believe that the church has replaced Israel. Yeah. Do you buy into the idea that it, the church has taken all the blessings and promises from the Israel reality uh, people? Uh, I'll give you uh, two pieces of scripture in regard to that answer. Okay. Um, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, not all of Israel is of Israel. And what he means there, I mean, obviously he's using that term Israel in two different ways. Okay. The first, I think most commentaries agree when he says not all of Israel is talking about the Jewish people. 
Not every Jewish person is going to be part of Israel. And the second, he's speaking about Israel as the kingdom people. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means that Israel, that kingdom people, there's going to be Jewish, there's going to be a Jewish component, but there's also, and the reason why Israel was created mm -hmm. was to be a blessing to the Gentiles. So in that kingdom people, there's going to be Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles. So that's a very important understanding of Israel. The Jewish people and the Gentiles can find those blessings. But in Daniel chapter 9, I won't mention the theologian. If, if you believe <laughs> the church has replaced Israel, you've got to take Romans 9 and 11 and throw them out the window. That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, there's a very well known uh, uh, biblical teacher in the Midwest, and he uses Daniel chapter 9, you know, a great passage. We, we think about the last few verses. But in the beginning, there's that great prayer that Daniel mm. makes. Mm. And powerful. he begins, and in Daniel chapter 9, verse 4, <clears throat> he speaks about the fact that, that we disobeyed you, God, and because of that, we, we were scattered, we went out from the land. And this person says, there you have it. <laughs> okay? Israel disobeyed God. They were a covenant-breaking people, and they lose the, the, the right to the land. Or they'll use that verse where the God breaks the rod, and it considers divorce, and therefore Israel okay. is... Exactly. They'll use that all the and, time. And, but what, uh -huh. what, what they do is they rip that out of context because Daniel's yeah. whole prayer is, but now the time of exile has ended. The 70 years have come to an end, and he's bringing the people back. back. Well, if you use that argument, none of us have any hope because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, all of us have been disobedient. Does that mean that the, the promises of God are revoked? Absolutely God not. says He's faithful even when we're unfaithful. So, prophetically, we see that in the last days there's going to be a remnant Israel is going to go through a time of trouble. That trouble has one purpose, to cause Israel to look up, mm -hmm. to seek that Messiah. And to this, their surprise, that Messiah is going to be Jesus of Nazareth. They're going to look upon those marks where He was crucified, and they're going to mourn Him and receive Him. So, those promises of the land are still in effect. Yes. I mean, oh, yes. I'm a fulfillment of that. God took me from Chicago. <laughs> I'm living now in Israel. And you know, if you go back to 1948, there was about 600,000, maybe right. 700,000 Jewish wow, people all. in Israel. And now it's 10 times that. 10 times that. Plus, if you go back to 1967, there were no uh, Messianic congregations in America. But about 1970, suddenly there's just a tremendous <laughs> move of the Spirit That's and right. young people are coming to Jesus. It's just unbelievable what happened among the Jewish people. Uh, God the is The first faithful. fruits of the remnant. God's faithful and He's going to restore through that same truth that, that the, the church had to believe. We have about two and a half minutes left in this segment, and I just have to get in this question because <laughs> we ask every guest this question. Do you believe we're living in the season of the Lord's return, and if so, why? Um, Israel's enemies are on her border. Mm -hmm. Israel, as I said earlier, are returning back to, to the land. Uh, the Har Habayat, the Temple Mount, is in the hands of the Jewish people. Uh, I do believe that we are, are very near to, to our blessed hope. I like how you use that term so frequently. <laughs> um, I believe in the blessed hope, and I believe that we are very near that time. Well, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews tend to believe that uh, we're living in the end times also. I mean, when I go to Israel, I, I see signs, you know, look up, uh, well, the Messiah's coming, and there's things like this. Uh, a term, we were, Nathan and I were talking about this uh, off camera, but the term Geulah, meaning redemption. Mm -hmm. And, and that term just wasn't very popular. It was not used in Judaism. Today, Geulah, there are studies about Geulah and the Messiah in, in Orthodox Judaism. Hmm. So, there's a greater awareness of these <clears throat> promises. People are interested. And, and the greatest change that I've seen is in talking with Israelis and openness to discuss these things. I've not been harassed. In fact, <laughs> in the last 15 years, I see a yeah. greater increase of people Wanting to know. Yeah. Praise well, the Lord. I, I've seen films of uh, the recapture of Jerusalem in 1967, which we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of in June of this year. And um, Rabbi Shlomo Gorham comes up to the Western Wall. He's got a Torah scroll. He's got a shofar. He blows the shofar. And one of many things he said was, I proclaim to you the beginning of the Messianic age. He was aware that we're moving into the mm -hmm. end times. There are many signs that, that confirm that. And anti-Semitism rising. Yeah. I mean, you can't Fortunately. have a time of Jacob's trouble And the whole without world coming against Israel. The whole, you know, people for years said, well, that, you know, I know it says that, but it'll never be America. Well, well yeah. <laughs> we have joined the world. 
we have come together against Israel. We lifted our vote in the United Nations, our veto, to let Israel be condemned. In the very place, Isaiah 54, that says Jewish people must go and rebuild these cities, yes. it's those places that the UN says it's forbidden, it's yes. illegal. Here's for the Jewish whole world falling there. apart, ISIS uh, cutting <laughs> off heads, uh, Syrian civil war, and the United Nations Security Council is voting on whether or not Israel should be building apartments. <laughs> It's even, crazy. Even Ban Ki moon came out and said that the UN spends an exorbitant amount of time focused on Israel, which is just a great fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy, an interview with Dr. Baruch Corman from Israel. Dr. Corman, great to have you on. Thank you so much. Could you tell folks how they can get in touch with you? The best way is to visit our website, Love Israel, just like the nation of Israel, loveisrael.org. And can they get your TV program there? We have uh, over 450 videos from our television program there. Great. I want to thank you again for being with us. Mm -hmm. It's been a real joy. Thank you, you have for a your safe trip back to Israel. Thank okay. you, sir. Folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope the Lord willing that you'll be back with us next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful for your redemption is drawing near. The Bible is literally filled with prophecies about the Jewish people past, present, and future. And in fact, the Jewish people are the focus of end time Bible prophecy. Folks, I've spent the past 40 years studying these remarkable prophecies and their fulfillments, and I have put together a summary of them in a new book of mine that is titled, Israel in Bible Prophecy, Past, Present, and Future. The incredible story of Israel in Bible prophecy is proof positive of the existence of God and that the Bible is the Word of God. The first section of the book takes a look at four prophecies that were fulfilled before the beginning of the 20th century. The second section features seven prophecies that were fulfilled in whole or in part during the 20th century. The final section of the book takes a look at the prophecies concerning the future of Israel, showing how the suffering of the Jewish people in the Great Tribulation will lead to their national repentance and salvation. Finally, there is an epilogue in which I explain how all this is relevant to Christians in the 21st century. The book runs 256 pages in length, and it can be yours for a donation of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. To order a copy, either call our office at the number you see on the screen or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. If you call, please call Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time. I believe this book will be a great blessing to you. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.